Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Fabrication Friday podcast. I'm your host, Joe Fairley, certified prosthetist, 3D printing enthusiast, and owner of Ascent Fabrication. Fabrication Friday is an all-around fun time where I talk about 3D printing applications, conduct interviews with industry leaders, and much more. Come join us every Friday for an informational discussion around the evolution of the additive manufacturing field and how we utilize various digital workflows and 3D printing methods in our daily work at Ascent Fabrication. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Fabrication Friday podcast. I'm your host, Joe Fairley. Um, we've been on a little bit of a hiatus over the last uh, two, three months, um, but Happy New Year, maybe a belated Happy New Year, but thank you for coming back and listening to the Fabrication Friday podcast. Um, very happy to have you. Um, if you're new to the show, uh, go back a few episodes and uh, really catch back up on some of the other uh, exciting guests that we've brought on the show. Um, so, you know, this year we're really focusing on um, bringing in some new guests and we want to hear from some of our uh, listeners to see, you know, what would you want to hear about from the 3D printing industry? Um, you know, are you looking to start your own 3D printing business? Are you already involved pretty heavily in the 3D printing industry? And is there something that, you know, at Ascent Fabrication here that we could help you out with? Um, to help you grow your business or just offer some uh, tips and suggestions for materials, for printers, um, for software, uh, whether it's slicer software, CAD design software, um, or just general, you know, how to get started and kind of finding your niche. Um, you know, that's going to be kind of the theme here of this episode, you know, finding your niche within 3D printing um, for people who are interested in getting into the 3D printing space um, or already might have already uh, started their own small uh, side business. So I'm pretty excited to have Mr. Alex Parton from Parton Prince on today. Um, so let's go ahead and listen in on that podcast. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Fabrication Friday podcast. Um, today, I have a, a pretty esteemed guest, someone that I've been following for um, probably the better half of about six months now. Um, and it came about where I was actually looking to uh, bring in some other 3D printing filament uh, into Ascent Fabrication. Um, and Alex Parton from Parton Prints here. Alex, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Uh, looking forward to hearing about Parton Prints and uh, kind of what you guys have going on over there. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. So with, uh, you know, I kind of reached out originally because I saw that Parton Prints offers, uh, you know, PLA filament uh, for, for sale. Um, but kind of tell me, you know, before backtrack, before you brought in PLA and started up your 3D printing farm, kind of how did you get into 3D printing in the first place and what drove you to create a 3D printing business? Yeah, uh, it's a funny story. So I needed a hobby. I was traveling a lot for work. Um, I, I did try, I, I'm in sales recruiting on a, for a full-time perspective, but I was traveling a lot for work and I wanted something that wasn't video games uh, to be a hobby, something that I could create and we've all been there, right? Like creating something is really kind of, a, I think it's a driving factor for a lot of people. And I thought, okay, cool. What I have a background in management information systems. So I was like, what can I combine with that and then make a hobby out of it? But I'm not really a tinkerer per se. Like I like the technology. So I was like, okay, 3D printing looks cool. So I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. Right. And so when I started 3D printing, that was what, almost like six years ago, 2018 at this point. And, um, yeah, it, it it was to I had a CR10, so what we started with. I wanted to print big. I thought if I if I I didn't want to be able to hold no, right? So if you're printing a helmet or something like that when it comes to to like your cosplay stuff, and I wasn't a cosplayer either, I just thought it'd be cool to have a whatever the cosplay helmet would be at the time. Sure. And uh so I was like, okay, cool, we'll get into it. So I started printing stuff. I'm not really a trinket guy either, so I just started giving stuff away. My wife was like, hey you're you're spending 20 25 dollars a roll on filament and then just giving stuff away if you want this hobby yeah. um you got to make money out of it or something right so fair enough <laughs> i only i actually with the cr10 i think i had it i got it in 2018 and then there was so much tinkering involved for it with me that i just gave up 3d printing for like six months didn't mm -hmm. didn't touch the 3d printer for six months like okay and i think it was in june of the following year in 2019 where i said okay you know what I see this other printer. 
it's a Prusa printer. And I was like, okay, it's, it looks like it's tested. I don't have to twist the knobs to level the bed, or I'm not staying up till midnight trying to figure out if it's level or not. Uh, so we, you know, took a chance, got one. It's more more expensive printer than at the time CR10. I think it was 400 bucks. That was 800, 900 for the Prusa. But I had probably dumped about that much money into my CR10 to make it work, right? So then I just jumped into getting that and we're like, okay, now we're actually getting into creating things. We put, we opened up an Etsy store, like most, I think 3D printers do started seeing what fit and what worked, started niching down in certain niches. So I think at first it was spaghetti on a wall just to see what would work. Uh, and then we started finding, you know, what worked for us specifically and, and uh, different markets that we could focus. And I use my sales experience, which is what I'm actually good at yeah. uh, to, uh, sales and marketing to to get us a little bit further in terms of um, going from one printer to two printers to 10 to now I think we're up to about 30 of them. Nice, nice. That's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a slippery slope with uh, the number of printers. You, it's easy to buy six at a time when, yeah. you know, you already have 16 <laughs> on the shelves, right? Um, yeah, no, that's a, it sounds like w one of the more kind of classic approaches to um, everyone else that I'm seeing on any kind of social media that, you know, has some kind of print farm right now where, you know, might have started out as a hobby, but, you know, slowly we're starting to learn about the ways that we can actually, you know, provide consumer products to people right. and, you know, create sustainable businesses this way. So. Yeah. And, and for us, it was kind of like the way my wife will put it and she's, she's part owner of the company. We had another owner or a partner at the time. It was us playing business, right? Like we didn't, we had no intention of making a company that would last this long. It was more so like, Hey, just to cover the cost of filament, enjoy it. Still kind of a hobby. And then the hobby actually morphed into making money by doing it. And now that's more enjoyable than the 3d printing aspect of it for me. Like sure. we're, we're providing either it's a service for something or a product for something or helping other people. We got into a, a specific niche at one point that we were providing a tool for other people to potentially make money with that. Right. So that to me, it's like, cool, if we can, if we can make it easier for those people to make money, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Right. And I think, you know, um, if you can go around it that way, I think that's an, a, a specific, whatever the market would be for that, that's a good way to, you know, help others, right? Yeah, we're making money, but everyone else can make money too. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, if you can help someone and then help yourself in the process and then help the third person down the line, that can right. at the Trickle end of the trail, you know, it's, yeah, that it's definitely coming to a much more everyday approach for people right. seeing more 3D printed products out there in the wild. Um, you know, I think it's going to be uh, just a matter of time before we really see more of these 3D printed products uh, everywhere we go. So right. it's pretty neat that you found, you know, a couple nice niches, it sounds like for, you know, um, kind of the applications that you've been using FDM 3D printing for. Um, so what made you choose FDM 3D printing over, you know, uh, SLA or, or any type of SLS? You know? That's an easy one. I'm a bull in a China shop. Yeah. <laughs> so... When it comes to resin, I try, I've tried resin myself okay. uh, and I would get it everywhere, just everywhere. Yeah. Um, and so to me, FDM is just a, it's user-friendly. Again, I'm not a tinkerer, so I'm not going to sit there and try to figure out the easiest way to do it. I want to pop it off the build plate, clean it up a little bit and get it out the door versus, you know, making sure that all the UV or all the uh, resin is cured with a UV, IPA, like there's a whole process to that where there's five extra steps. For me, I mean, this is just me personally. I like the detail of it. If, if I could get it to do it and also cost effectiveness too, like where a roll of filament, depending on the product could get you, can net you way more than what a bottle of resin could. And now resin, I think at this point has come down in price a little bit. I haven't seen it recently because I don't really pay attention to it. Yeah. Um, but there's there so many factors to us for, for that specifically. Um, and I, I, you know, just FDM overdoing anything else, whatever other type of material, um, it, it's just a speed factor, pivotable factor. Yeah, we can, you know, with SLA, you can still change the design and fix it. But it, for us, it just made sense for what we were doing. Right. And, you know, with that, you know, FDM 3D printing with uh, some of the models that are out online, you can readily download something and um, yeah. go ahead and start making money off of other people's designs too. 
Um, what kind of approach have, have you gone after? Whether are you designing your own parts and then and then printing them, or in most cases, yeah, finding other parts that other people are making for you? Yeah, so probably a combination of both. I mean, the way I started was, you know, you got Thingiverse, you got printables, whatever that would be commercially licensed ones that you're able to like, hey, we can, we're allowing you to make this design, print it, sell it, never to do the non-commercial ones, wouldn't suggest that. Always want to respect the designers whenever they're making stuff, right? Right. Uh, but doing doing that and then you start making connections in the industry. So um, I joined a few Patreons at the time, made some friends from those who were designers. I'm not a designer myself personally. I can, I'm dangerous in it, but what takes sure. me like a week and a half to do takes someone 30 minutes to do. I'm just not a designer. Sure. Um, so, you know, we've brought people on board as designers for part of our team. Um, nice. Obviously it's, it's, it works out in their benefit. You know, they're, they're getting to do what they like to do, which is design and make money from it. And I get to do what I like to do, which is the manufacturing and the selling and the marketing aspect of it. So right. using our platform essentially to help that. We give them ideas and then they just work with us from there. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, plenty of very, you know, talented CAD designers out there that oh. are, you know, more than willing to work as freelancers and, uh, you know, having their own little small businesses around that too, growing into, you know, this necessity for uh, needing parts for 3D printing. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, in the in the approach of, um, you know, I know recently on, on Instagram, you've been kind of putting some... Um, you know, little tips and tricks out there for other, you know, people looking to get into some type of business like this or just starting up, you know, bringing their hobby into, um, you know, getting into making some money with it. And that's a big jump. And to have like the CAD skills and the 3D printing skills and the sales skills all in one, um, you know, you can't do it all and you can't do it all well, you know. Um, I, I definitely am one person to say, like, I don't have a business background whatsoever, but, uh, you know, I know 3D printing really well, and I found a nice niche to get into, right. uh, you know, for the prosthetics and orthotics space. Um, but I, I really do appreciate what you're starting to do there with, um, you know, your your Instagram posts for the, uh, you know, putting out a little bit of, you know, supportive information for people like us who are, you know, so enthusiastic about the 3D printing industry in general, and then, wanting to do something, you know, a little bit extra beyond the hobby. Um, you know, I think that's, that's, uh, that guidance is really needed right now. Yeah. In the field. Agreed. Well, and for me, and I think we started off with that. So it was me, my wife, and then our third business partner, where each one had a split of the company. Right. Mm -hmm. And so she, my wife, Spencer, she is operations. She's a project manager by heart. So she does everything, manages everything, quality control, uh, the packing, the shipping, everything. If it if it goes out the door, it sees her eyes first and it doesn't leave without, to be honest, if it was me, and I think this is most 3D printers are like, ah, this is good enough, right? Yeah. Um, now there's stuff that obviously I'm going to look at and be like, ah, it's not good, but we sure. pride ourselves on that. And that's specifically because of her. And then the finance stuff, like I'm, I'm good with numbers, but I'm not an accountant. So right. we had a guy who specifically, his name was Ryan. He was part of our team um and he stepped back after a while um but he would focus on that so set up the llc set up the the accounts and i think you need someone who can do that piece and my my philosophy there is i'd ma much rather make 70 percent of something than zero percent of nothing right mm -hmm. um i don't need to do it all and if i do it all i'm going to burn myself out that's why right. we've, we've started reaching out to designers and working with them specifically to focus on stuff that i'm not good at um you know with the accounting stuff, we eventually got an accountant to specifically focus on that too. So that's right. what, I mean, I, I always say delegation is going to be the key to being successful. You're not going to be, you only have so many hours in the week. And even as an entrepreneur, as you know, like if you, <laughs> you're going to be giving 80 hours a week versus working 40 hours a week for somebody else, right? right. Um, right. You need to, you need to be focusing on what your strengths are versus trying to do it all. Yeah, for sure. And and working 80 hours for yourself versus working, you know, 40 hours for someone else, there's a, that's a big difference. Um, and your, you know, your level of dedication, what you want to focus on for, uh, you know, building different parts of the company. So, um, and as you well know, I'm sure it's a, it's quite the process, right? It's, a, you know, not just the nine to five uh, day and, um, you know, we're, we're talking right now on the weekend, getting ready right. for you know, this fabrication Friday post. So, you know, there's, there's times where, 
Yeah, I think you know you're you're super excited. I think I saw one of your posts recently about the the up and down graph that you had of like, oh, this is a really great idea. Oh, yeah. not a great idea. Oh, I've got this other great idea. Oh, well, you know, this can't make money. Or you know, throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks is, I think, kind of the uh, um, you know indoctrinating period that all of us you know uh, who are getting into three D printing and figuring out where our niche is and what we're good at in the in this part of the industry is almost, you know, what we have to go through in order to find something great that, you know, we can 3D print and offer a good product for people. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I feel like that's no different from most businesses, but yeah, I mean, if, if I, if I can tell you like what my feelings are throughout the week, it is definitely up and down <laughs> on what, I mean, or seasonal, right? I mean, like yeah. for most, for most people who are in e-commerce at all, your October, November, December are going to be your big months. Right. Yeah. And so if you are doing okay throughout the year, fantastic. But like last year, for example, I think for most people, 2023 was a, was a rough year. So that up and down was a lot more than normal. So you're like, oh man, I'm really banking on on Q4 to be to be that year. And that's, I mean, when when it comes down to B to C specifically, that's that's going to be a big big piece of it. I think that you got to really be prepared to for disappointment. But how you're going to get past that that disappointment, have that failure? Like, what are you going to do? And the nice thing about 3D printing versus you know, I, people who drop ship or people who make a specific product and then try to sell it is that you could pivot. If that part didn't work specifically, change it a little bit. And then now you're doing something completely different. Maybe it's for a whole different niche that you didn't even know existed. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you make a good point with the, uh, the ebbs and flows over the months of, you know, kind of what products you're offering and who that's best suited to, what kind of audience um, so like I'm more so in the the B2B side of things uh, for the most part, but last year I kind of dabbled in the B2C uh, trying to find, you know, some consumer products because, um, you know, we do some other prototyping services, you know, general prototyping um, and, and CAD design. Um, and we found, uh, you know, we found the Etsy side of things to be a little, uh, a little daunting, honestly, when you first look at Etsy and you're like, there's, 40,000 different 3D printing people that are just putting stuff out there all day long. Dragons. Um, <laughs> so yeah, how do you compete with, uh, you know, the same type of prints going out there all the time? Um, I think with that, you, you gotta, you gotta take a step back and be like, okay, yes, I am 3D printing. Yeah. But what am I doing? Right? Am I in the video game niche? Right? Am I focusing on that? Is it, is it focusing on keychains i'm gonna be the best keychain maker ever i'm just throwing that out there as an example but mm -hmm. the the medium yes is 3d printing but the end result and maybe it's keychains for teachers right so you have sayings that are specifically on that you're targeting teachers in that niche and maybe it's not even just teachers it's fourth grade teachers getting in the sub niche right mm -hmm. so that market obviously is going to be pretty small in comparison to a much broader thing but you're not competing against 3d printers you're competing against other people who are making that specific product Right. Mm -hmm. So if if everyone and, and, and 3D printing has just become more accessible for everybody at this point that you can buy a bamboo lab, you know, a one whenever they're back out <laughs> on stock. So we'll say the a one mini for 300 bucks. Right. And you can make keychains. But if you're just putting up dragons or eggs or whatever, if you're competing with people who are making 3D printed project products. Right. So I think the mindset there is focusing on that those niches or those products specifically and then being okay how do i how do i make stuff around that and it just so happens that it's 3d printed it's kind of mm -hmm. like someone who has a laser engraver like it just so happens it's made in wood but i'm laser engraving i'm not talking about the process of laser engraving whenever i'm actually selling the product i want to see the result if i'm buying a car i don't care how it's made i want it i want right. the miles per gallon i want um to know if there's a leather interior like all that stuff that's what i'm looking for versus yeah. the actual process unless it's, i'm assuming like a uh, an electric car. Those are a little, a little cooler to, I'm assuming the processes to make, but, but, you, but you get, I mean, it's, it's focusing on specifically the product itself. Right. So can you talk about some of the products that, uh, that you guys put out at Parton Prince and um, kind of what you've seen do really well, or just be really interesting and in, in finding those niches? Yeah. So, I mean, I would say we've, we've focused on the, the main things that we focused on just because it, it becomes more about what you're interested in too, I think. So like video games, big under that. We combine our laser and 3D printing to make stuff that is accessible for 
people who like video games, headphone holders, um, controller holders, just as an example, a lot of personalized stuff. That's what we use the laser for, right? Yeah. If you go on our website, you can see all this. So there's nothing that to essentially hide there. We Everything we do is is upfront and, and in your face when it comes to it. Um, but personalized items, I mean, I think just in general, those are going to be the, the key seller for anybody, right? And you can find ones, again, that are more personalized, where it's kind of a combination of a specific niche, and we'll just use fourth grade teachers again, right? Fourth grade teachers, and then personalizing that specific product for it. Um, so that's that's what we found. Again, we talked about, you know, making items that are specific for other um, makers, right? So someone who doesn't have a 3D printer, but needs a right. 3D printer piece to then sell so uh to use to make whatever they're making right so mm -hmm. you can find all that kind of stuff whenever it's like I, a good example i was talking to someone the other day they had a laser and they or no sorry it was a woodworker and he had created a extra extender piece for one of his vacuums right and he's like okay well i made this maybe someone else will want this right and that is you're solving a problem and then right. selling it someone else might not have it and and you got to think some people like for us we have a we have uh, 3D printers, we have lasers, we have hat presses, we have all that kind of stuff. The one thing we don't have is a CNC. So for me, if there's something I'm like, oh, this would be great for me to use, I just don't have a CNC, I'll have someone make that and then I'll buy that, right? So it's the same thing, like this CNC product, I don't care if that CNC made, it's like how it's made, sure, but I need the end result to have that result for whatever the product for my 3D printer or my laser to make it better, right? So that's... Right. That's what I would say when you're when you're focusing on products and and how we've done that is just trial and error, right? Mm -hmm. What works, what doesn't work. The nice thing about Etsy is just as an example, for ten bucks you can list twenty listings, or sorry, for ten bucks you can list fifty listings, right? right? So you can do ten and di ten different niches, or five and or five items in ten different niches, and see like, hey, does this work? Does this not work? If it doesn't, then you can pivot to whatever it is. Start seeing that like gaming's working or um, cosplay stuff's working or, uh, personalized items are working. Okay. Well, that works. We'll start making more listings specifically around that. So that's right. been our process. And then we use just like SEO tools to figure out like E-rank, for example, to see what works on Etsy. What's, what's selling is a hot, is an evergreen item is something that's going to be more seasonal, right? Valentine's day is what, three days from now. Right now, it's not a good time to jump into Valentine's Day. You need right. like 30-ish days for it to start getting that SEO going within the, right. Etsy's own like SEO search. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, solely using Etsy and then your own website for, for sales like that? Have you tried anything else? Yeah, um, mainly Etsy and our website. We've tried doing farmer's markets. Um, for us, it was time-consuming. Uh, just yeah. the amount of times that you have to go, you have to set up, you have to have product there. And our, because of the nature of our stuff being more personalized, they weren't grab and go items. And that's what really sells at farmer's markets is the, mm -hmm. oh, this is 10 bucks. I'm going to grab it and walk away. So for example, people love the dragons. Those seem to work with them. I think it's going to get even saturated when you have five people who are at a market doing 3D printed stuff. Yeah. But um, you, you could do that. We just, we invested money and time into it. And then we also have, a, at this point, we have a two-year-old daughter, but at the time she was six months i think and so we we took her to one and that was fine because she just sat there but as she got older it was a little bit more unruly to do yeah, sure. um, and then also just time consuming on when they were doing it too and usually they're not convenient for the sellers they're convenient for the people who are coming in and actually seeing it so it could have just been the markets that we were at we went to a few different ones but we just never really saw the return that we were looking for um that's that's an option we've also done some bulk orders with people who, for example, just reach out and say, Hey, we see that you do great products, blah, blah, blah. We have this thing. We need multiple of it. So we've done that. So we worked B2B yeah. less on the website. And it's more just like word of mouth, people reaching out specifically about stuff. You start, right. if you start showing and producing quality, people will come, you know, the field of right. dreams. If you build it, they will come. Right. 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 That's not my yeah, I've, I've had the, that, that same mentality throughout most of, uh, me trying to build the scent fab uh, over the past three years. And, um, you know, to a point, I think that that definitely rings true when it comes to the quality of what we're right. supplying, right? So, um, you know, I've found that, you know, you can have really high quality prints with even the low cost printers. Um, you know, we use quite a few artillery Sidewinder X2 printers um, that right now are, you know, being pretty much sold out. Um, 
at 199 on their on their website because they're getting uh, trying to get rid of their inventory to make room for the X3 and the X4, um, but still at a really uh, very entry level cost at about $300 for those printers uh, with a big build volume of 300, 300, 400. You know, you can definitely do a lot with that printer um, and it's easy to set up out of the box too, right? Um, you know, I personally haven't had any Prusa printers, although I've been, you know, obviously I know about them. What has been your experience specifically with the Prusa printers and, um, you know, why did you decide to go for, you know, a pretty big multiple of that one printer versus, right. you know, maybe doing 10 of this, 10 of that, 10 of this? Yeah, absolutely. So we, like I said, we started off with the CR10. And like I said, I almost, I almost quit 3D printing. Um, but the reason for me was just consistency. When I, at that point, I think they had that, the Mark III or the Mark III S, I can't remember, had been out for four or five years. So tested, their support was great. I've never really had to use support a lot um, just because they kind of worked right out of the box. And when I say right out of the box, I bought them as kits. So part of the process for me was because I'm not a tinker and I'm not someone who, I can Google search like anybody else, right? So I can find the problem. I think I probably ruined my CR10 by the amount of Googling that I did. Um, and, and so the, ni the nice thing about Prusa was they had everything, all their FAQs, all their knowledge-based stuff right in one spot. I was able to solve problems pretty easily if they did, they did come up, but I knew where things went because I, I pieced it together, right? So um, when that happened, the quality of print from what I had with my Prusa to my CR10, because we had them at the same time, was just night and day for me. And I wasn't having to wake up at one o'clock in the morning and, and oh, wow, this this failed after seven hours, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the auto leveling was was crucial for me. Mm -hmm. Then at that point, we actually, we I've used Anycubic. At one point, Anycubic reached out for us to to use some of their printers. So I had a couple of theirs. And then I had and I had the Prusa Mini at one point as well. I'm trying to think if there's anyone else specifically that we had. And we have a few bamboo, which I'll get into in a second. but. The quality for me just was always consistent with Prusa. And the other part that I found was that if I had multiple different printers, I had to slice that file multiple different times. Mm -hmm. So for right. me, it came down to time and efficiency. So if I can just slice it once, put it on the 30 SD cards, fantastic, right? right. So um, we, we had the Octopi on there. So again, everything could be wireless, but you have to plug it into the wall um, if you do that. And if the power went out for the uh the pie then it also went out for the proof and it didn't auto restart so we just moved to just doing everything manually um each each card has i think like 300 something items on them at this point mm -hmm. um so it just made it easier just to do that and we the, i would highly suggest if you do have multiple and you're using sd cards get an sd card copy reader and then just put one in there and just copy it so i was doing at one point just updating every single card and that just got manually yeah. like time consuming right um but I think it's 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 only focusing on one printer to do the one G code file and having that for every single one. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of time in the day to be sitting there slicing stuff and oh wait did I do this setting for this one did I do this setting for that one I can't remember and then if I if I ever had to go back to fix that G code because maybe something messed up then I'm like okay well I have it saved in one and then I had to go and change it in this it just was too much work for us at that point right. and I'm the one who specifically was focusing on the tech. Um, and both of us at the time were working full time. So working full time, trying to do that in the off hours. And then once you throw a kid in the mix, man, it just yeah. it's too much, too much time. Um, but the Prusa mini, for example, I had that wasn't a huge fan. So I'm not like a fanboy specifically. I love my Prusa. Prusa and I love what they've done and they've, and they've worked great and barely any maintenance to it. Uh, but it hasn't always been hits, right? That was not my favorite printer, but also from a build size perspective, it was a little bit too small for stuff we did. Um, but I also have an XL, which works great, but it's also too big for stuff we do because I don't really do that much when it comes to big. But I wanted to be able to say, yes, I can do that project for you if I needed to. But I liked the being in the same ecosystem versus getting like a, a, um, a bigger printer like the K1 or something, which I'll never go back to reality, but that's my own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you're a little uh, a little jaded after your CR10 experience. <laughs> They're going to come after me. There's going to be people who are going to comment on this. Oh, and go, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's the thing, though. It's like if you if you are the tinker, if you really want to dive deep into how that printer is working, and you could get almost any printer running fairly well for right. what you want to do your application, right? Yeah. Um, but it, it's about that amount of time that you want to spend finding that right solution for you. 
Yeah. And then if you're trying to scale a business like that, is that even scalable? You know, are you are you purchasing a three hundred dollar printer and then putting three hundred dollars worth of parts on it? Exactly. And not just buy like an eight hundred dollar printer that you don't have to do anything to, right? That was our mindset too. And at, at some point, we it got to the point where we're like, okay, we can't even we don't have time to put the kits together because they take about nine hours to put together. So, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, well, we'll just buy them pre made, and those are good too. I mean, it's just a little bit more expensive, but you start paying. It's a cost. You know, what are you going to do? Are you going to spend time making stuff or tinkering or are you going to start making money and to me it was like okay i can make more money by doing this i'll sink the cost first and then go from there mm -hmm. yeah so with that um are you always using the same slicer software for everything um i saw one yeah posts about slicing the other day too yeah so well so I, and i forgot we did end up getting a few of the bamboos yeah. Um, it's funny. I did a I did a podcast two weeks ago with uh, Nico from Nico Industry, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, eventually going to plan on moving to the A1." And then literally, <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, everyone get one." A week later, they did the recall, and I was like, uh. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. "Which is fine. I mean, it, it will come out after the whole recall thing." But um, but yeah, I mean, uh, we 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 have some bamboo printers, and I, I do like them, um, even the P1P. So for that, I, I use the native slicing software for it so i like using prusa for prusa and i like using um i like using the bamboo slicer for my bamboo printers right um this is me personally i know there's work slicer out there i haven't used it i'm sure it's great um but it's kind of like i tried to use uh creality for or uh, cura for prusa and i just didn't think it was great right and i tried using prusa for some of the any cubes i had and i didn't think it was great um right. they they do okay but I just don't think they, it's, it's kind of like if someone was making a product for somebody else's product, like this is good enough. And that's what it felt like right. from both sides of that, right. um, where, you know, Cura is definitely leans more towards like Creality and Anycubic and stuff like that. I feel like, and then mm -hmm. for me, it was the Prusa just, I can use stock settings for the most part, minus changing a few yeah. things and it works great. For sure. You, now, are you using, and I don't, I haven't seen your farm or anything like that. Are you using desktop 3D printers? Yes. Yeah. So the uh, the desktop printers that we have currently, we've got three artillery Sidewinder X2s. That's right. Okay. Um, we've got an FL Sun Super Racer. Okay. And that's now over three years old. And uh, yeah, haven't really had to change much on it. Yeah. Uh, that makes it so much better. It makes printing yeah. enjoyable. What's that? It's that it makes printing enjoyable. Right? Oh, when exactly. You're just like, okay, cool. I can hit print and go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, so right now the FL Sun actually is just our logo coaster maker. Um, yeah. we just print like two or three logo coasters um, of our own to give away with uh, our other products, um, and that's what it's going on all day long. Um, so it's a it's actually not a direct drive. It's a it's a Bowden drive system, um, but it can print flexibles pretty well actually. Interesting. Uh, with the um, I forget exactly what extruder it is from CME CNC, I think the the easy extruder or something like that, but it does a really nice job with flexibles. Um, so we print um, quite a bit of TPU on it, have had some good success there. You know, the, the Delta style, so it, for some of my uh, experience with printing, I wanted to also, you know, not have to say no to people. Uh, when they came to me with, you know, being a brand new business and wanting to be able to appease the masses of, okay, you've got a lot of great ideas. Let's see what actually fits uh, within our business plan and what we can offer, you know, as a good product to people. So um, I, I took the route of not getting 30 of the same printer yet, um, <laughs> but having actually nine different printers currently. Um, yeah of all shapes and sizes so that I can offer a huge variety um, from, you know, the little trinkets, like, uh, you know, I've got, I printed this uh, latch for my watch, um, oh, nice. you know, because it had broke. So it's just a TPU, um, you know, latch and um, something as small as that up to as big as um, uh, actually like a human torso, right? We're printing um, thoracic, lumbar, sacral orthoses that are TLSOs, yeah, really big uh, parts. You know, we could be printing um, even longer parts as well. So I have a black belt 3D printer. Have you heard of the black belt yet? I have not heard of that one, no. Oh, you're going to want a black belt after this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look into it for sure. 
So full disclosure, uh, actually, Black Belt. Ah, there you go. I'm, I'm the North American distributor of the Black Belt <laughs> printer. Uh, so the Black Belt is a, is it a, it's an industrial conveyor belt printer. Um, but basically, you've got 340 by 340 by infinity. So oh. you, can just, you can just print continuously, whether you're printing part after part after part, or you're printing um, some really long extrusion profile. So uh, like the other day, I printed an eight foot long uh, part out of VarioShore from ColorFab TPU. Um, so this part just you know, kept on growing and uh, goes off onto the, the roller table after the, uh, the end of the printer. And uh, yeah, could print some That's really big components. So oh yeah, yeah, I'll, we'll uh, chat about that a little bit more <laughs> after, the, after the call. But you know, getting into real production style uh, printing too is something that I've been interested to get into. You know, how could we, you know, utilize these FDM 3D printers for more definitive parts that it's not just prototyping anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got patient end use components. You have um, parts that are actually going on to um, whether it's a, you know, watercraft or aircraft or something like that. Um, and you're using these, you know, machines to be able to produce these objects at scale. So, um, you know, the Black Belt was a really interesting concept to me, and I liked it so much. I've partnered with Black Belt to bring it to the U.S. and um, the Americas here. Um, so they're based out of Belgium. Um, a really great uh, couple uh, by the name of Peter and Iris uh, that actually own um, OMD 3D. Uh, okay. They're another 3D printing service contractor. Um, and offer a couple different printers for resale out of Belgium, um, and they have the rights to Black Belt. So, um, you know, that they've been great to work with, and uh, it's really neat learning how to print on an angle. Um, you know, we're printing at a 45-degree angle, right, actually, yeah. 35 degree angle, although you could, could, could go from 15 all the way up to 45 degrees. Um, so we're having to use less support material um, overall, because you can kind of orient the part slightly differently, and it can print 90 degree overhangs fairly well um, with the right printing properties and maybe a couple iterations of those settings. But um, so I've dived really, really deep into what different printers could I offer for people, and then uh, the print settings as well. I've I've gone down every rabbit hole you could possibly go down to make sure that. Like you said, each printer fits with a specific slicer a little bit differently. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Interestingly enough, so we use Prusa Slicer for the most part for um, all of the filament innovations printers, the high flow printers that we have, um, PVA Med here as well, um, a local company to me actually up upstate New York here, um, the artillery sidewinders. Um, I have a Raise 3D Pro 3 Plus as well because I wanted to be able to offer um, some, you know, parts that needed support material and a lot of it. Um, dual extrusion and Idea Maker, you know, from Raise 3D works really well for their printers. Um, but I'd agree with you that, like, you know, the the slicers are set up well for those companies that have developed those slicers for that software for that printer, um, and then it sort of kind of works, you know, okay for some other printers, but it depends on their operating system too, whether it's Marlin, RepRap, um, or anything else. So right. you know, Clipper, a whole new beast. Um, so yeah, on that side of things, we've kind of, you know, ventured into the, let's offer a lot of wide, wide variety uh, in size of things that we can print um, with implementing some of the same ideas and concepts you had too. Right. And I think that's smart. I mean, like every, every company is going to have different end results of what they're looking to do. Right. For us, it was like, yeah, we wanted to do different sizes, but at the same time, we wanted to just be able to pump stuff out as fast as possible. Right. Sounds like with, with your guys' stuff, it's prototyping, it's, it's offering the different sizes, the different materials. We stick with PLA just because it's super easy. It's uh, makes it so much faster for us to get stuff out the door. Um, I don't have to worry about changing the temperature or settings or anything like that. Um, but th this is a good example of how you could have two different 3D printing companies mm -hmm. doing different things completely and right. still be successful, right? Right. Yeah, for sure. And and like I said at the beginning of this, you know, I 
I started printing a little bit more in PLA um, at the at the end of last year because we were making some pretty neat um, prosthetic covers where I wanted to add in some color and some pizzazz. And um, so I, I was looking around, always looking around for, you know, better, better PLA that that's not brittle, that, you know, just works every single time. Um, and I'll be honest, you know, the stuff that you guys have and, and offer is, uh, you know, was working out really great. It still is working out great. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about, you know, why you decided to bring PLA into your offerings for, what you wanted to resell. Yeah. Well, for us, I mean, we wanted, there's a couple options for this. So, or a couple ideas behind it. One, we were buying <laughs> filament off of Amazon, like most people, right? You start off buying it from Amazon, buying it from Micro Center right down the road. We weren't seeing consistency in certain colors. Like we would buy 20 boxes of, specifically more in white, because we were doing a lot of white printing at one point. That okay. uh, we'd, you know, do one and then we'd switch over because they run out of filament and then it would be a different shade of white. Right. And this is going to happen with any 3d printing filament, just in general, when it, especially in white. Um, but we were seeing it in other colors too. So we wanted the, the consistency. And if we were going to do that, we wanted to make sure that we were, we, I couldn't send something that had different shades of white out to somebody. Right. right. Um, so that was one thing. Um, we also, I mean, cost is going to be a big thing. We wanted to bring down the cost for us. And if that saves us a few dollars here and there, then perfect. We'll do that. We can also start reselling it if possible, if anyone wanted it. Um, and for us, you know, we weren't trying to make, we're not trying to make millionaires off it. We wanted to provide an option that would be inexpensive for other people to print the same type of prints as us. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, Hey, you see that our yellow looks like this and it can come out this good and this shiny and this you know, beautiful, vibrant color. Yeah. I do this and I'll give you the settings for what it is to what I use on our producing machines. Now, every machine, again, is going to produce something a little bit different. Temperatures change things too. So, you know, what's going to be shiny or for mine is going to be a little bit different for, you know, someone who's printing on like a bamboo printer or, you know, an any cubic or something like that. Um, yeah. But generally speaking, I mean, it's been consistent. I've had multiple people who have bought it who have different types of printers than us and they get the same type of results and they're loving it, right? And if they want to... We wanted people to be able to make vibrant colored prints. And especially if you're doing multicolored prints, they just, they show so beautifully. Right. Um, that was our end result. I mean, it, again, it was just something to try to make it easier for, for other people as well as for us. I mean, if, if I'm going to speak a little selfishly there, right. Um, and easier for us to have more filament on hand. Right. So I didn't have to wait a few days to get it from Amazon. Right. Yeah, that was, again, a very similar uh, reason I brought in reselling filament because, um, you know, started to use so much of the same thing that it just makes sense at some point um, if you're buying in bulk anyways, um, then, you know, requesting from that company, can you become a reseller? Can you become an official distributor from that company? Um, and if you're not otherwise kind of sourcing and white labeling your own or, you know, trying to make something very specific that could be your own filament um, right. bring. So yeah, we brought in um, a lot of color fab filament um, and then uh, PP prints from Germany where they're North American distributor as well oh, for yeah. modern polypropylene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, you know, finding that polypropylene in general, uh, trying to find the right niche for that in the general 3D printing community is quite difficult. Um, you know, not many people print polypro and for some good reason, you know, it's pretty difficult to print well if you don't have the right settings, you have a lot of warping that goes on from right. the age of the material. Um, but yeah, we found, you know, we wanted to also help create solutions for people where if we're using, you know, these printers with this software, with this material, could we then um, teach someone else to do it? in that same respect and, you know, offer those same things to them at the same uh, price point and turnaround time. So, um, yeah, that was looking into, you know, wanting to have uh, PLA as an offering, you know, working with you on that, um, yeah. you know, for those awesome colors is definitely something I that I thought was beneficial. Yeah. And, and that you just said that something that makes sense to me is a turnaround time. And I think most people are are used to a two day turnaround time with, with uh, Amazon. Sorry, I couldn't think of it. The biggest yeah. seller, seller online. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean like you can, th that's an interesting thing because you can get two day turnaround time and you can get really, really cheap filament online. I think at this point, like you can find some for like $10 a roll. But I think the problem there is the consistency, mm -hmm. right? 
Yeah. I think it's, I think you wouldn't do this either. You wouldn't put your name on something that you didn't believe in. Mm-hmm. Right. right. For us, like I went through multiple different manufacturers to figure out what was going to be the right stuff for us and what was the most consistent. And that was, I mean, that was like a year long process for us to figure out what was the right stuff. And I couldn't just, I don't just don't want to slap my name on something and be like, yeah, here, you guys print like this too. And then right. realize like halfway down the road, like, oh man, this sucks. I don't want to do this. Right. So that's, I think that's the thing. Like, yeah, you can pay a little bit more. And there are some filaments that I think are like $34 a roll, which I'm, I would never pay for personally. Um, but it depends on what the application is for PLA. Right. I wouldn't, if it's something right. that's like, a, you know, more specific, you know, stuff like you were talking about, maybe depending on what the application would be and what my return would be on it. Mm-hmm. But I think that, you know, 16 to $19 a roll for quality filament is, is that sweet spot, right? For mm-hmm. most PLAs. Um, right. but you still find some online that are going to be more expensive than that too. Right. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a matter of consistency. Absolutely. Of finding the right, you know, you can buy cheaper filament out there. Um, but you know, for the reasons that you and I have tried to pin down, you know, one specific filament, it's like, if you've had other printing problems because the filament color isn't consistent over time, if the diameter of, of the filament isn't consistent over time, that's killed us. Right. Uh, if the filament consistently comes in like, uh, you know, crazy saturated with water, um, and then it's almost unusable at some points, um, especially for clear PETG that has to be clear, uh, yeah. you know, as transparent as possible, you know, having something that's cloudy really doesn't work very well. So we've had that issue with like actual acrylic because of the laser stuff is like, you need it to be clear and then they'll have scratches and like, this isn't going to work. So right. maybe one day we'll get into acrylic manufacturing, but until then. <laughs> Yeah, it's for gotta sure. be, it's gonna be good quality, it's gotta be consistent. I think that's for anything. And it goes yeah. back to like customer service. Like I've worked with some that um we bring up that issue when it comes to bad filament or something I'm like ah, it's a printer problem. And then when it when yeah. it goes directly to that's the first response, that's when you know there's an issue. And you know, what we've done so far is like walk through the process. Let's let's talk about it, let's have a conversation and see how we can get it to work for you. Right, for sure. So with, uh, I guess I want to jump back a bit for yeah. and, and talk about your experience with bamboo as well. So I don't have a bamboo printer. Um, you know, I I haven't jumped on that bandwagon quite yet. Um, but again, for good some good reason, you know, we like to print big here at Ascent. Yeah. So uh, the the build volume is a little uh, constricting for us. But what is your what has been your experience with bamboo? Well, funny enough, it's just a little bit bigger from a build volume than a Prusa machine. So. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say it's there. I think there's on both sides of, and I, I'm I'm saying both sides by Prusa and Bamboo because there's usually that's the contention point right now. Both printers are good printers. My my things with Bamboo, like I, they're not flawless. I've had flaws with them, um, and uh, you know, I, I would say the quality is great. The speed is what I really love about it. Right? Mm-hmm. If I can do a print in half the time and same quality. I mean, it's a no brainer for any business, right? Like, why would I do anything else? And that's why I always say, I'm, like, I'm not a Prusa fanboy. I appreciate the machine has been a workhorse and it's done what I needed to do for the past five years. And I will continue using those machines until I absolutely can't use them anymore. But I can I can modify them. The issue that I have with, with bamboo is I don't know from longevity how maintenance is going to be. Like, how easy is it going to be to fix stuff? And again, I told you, I'm not a tinkerer. Right. Yeah. The way that their system is, it will probably rely on more tinkering than what I would be good at. But out of the box, 30 minutes and I was printing. Mm-hmm. Right. So that to me, and it was good quality prints, multicolor prints for half the price too. So there's definitely pros to it. I think it'll be long term for me to be like, yeah, I'm switching my whole farm over to that. Right. Yeah. Um, and it just so happens the day that I, or two weeks or a month after, I say, yeah, I'm going to start adding more to my farm that's when they do the recall so yeah. the positive there is that they recognize what was going on they're giving sure. a uh are you familiar with happening with the recall no no i didn't didn't hear oh, that okay. which so they, specifically was it and what's what's going on yeah sorry i i should have been more clear it's the bmw one it's the newest one that just came out right? right so there's a little issue with the heat bed and i guess it depends on how you put the printer together mm-hmm. if you didn't listen to the instructions and put it on the wire, it would kink the wire a little bit. And because of that, it's causing some of the heat beds to catch on fire. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, which is pretty significant. Yep. Definitely. Um, 
initially they came out and said, hey, if you don't have this issue, you can print this little clip thing to it and it will solve the problem for the most part. Then they came back and said, yeah, we need everyone to stop using their printers. So okay. I think if you update your printer as of today, it'll stop you from using the printer. I'm not using it. I don't really need to use them. They're more for fast prototyping. So yeah. there's two options for that. You can, if you bought it from Bamboo or from Micro Center, you can return it. They'll give you a free refund and then $80 worth of credit for the Bamboo products. The alternative is you sign up and they give you, you keep the printer, you do a uh, manual swap of the heat bed and you have to actually go through and, and, and fix the, the print bed. And then they'll give you $100, $120 credit for the printer itself. So, or for bamboos. Um, and, I'll, and while I'm not a tinker, I know how to do things. And I can follow instructions and it looked relatively simple. So I'll probably just go that route rather than returning. I already threw my boxes away. Yeah, they're yeah. Big on the boxes. So um, I bought mine from Micro Center. So I'm I'm just going to do that. But that's that's the only downside. But they've, they've solved that problem within, as soon as they found out, I think it was like two weeks of them like doing research. And I think it's only 0.1% of printers that are actually having the issue. But if you're going to do a total recall, I think for them, from a PR perspective, it looks really good. Yeah, makes sense. I, don't, I haven't had to deal with their support. I'm not really sure. That's another issue that I've seen people with just in forums and, and Facebook. But like Prusa support down, like hands down, some of the best support I've ever had. Yeah. Uh, time will tell with Bamboo. Right. That that's my thing. And that's why I don't want to, I'm not gonna put my stamp of approval on it necessarily, but I'll say, you know, if the printer is working, it's working great. And I love that part of it. Mm. Yeah, well, with anything new too, you know, there's gonna be some kinks up and down um along the road of them, you know, yeah. putting out a new printer and um, with some of the print times that they're boasting and then the multicolor approach to, you know, it's kind of still uh, a pretty newer way of printing. So I'm sure there's bound to be a couple, you know, road bumps in, along the exactly. way. But um, Well, and, and they had the P1P, the, the X1 Carbon, they've had those out for a while, yeah. the P1S, and they released the, P, the A1 Mini. And I just pushed off. I think I just waited until I got one that looked like one of my Fruits and machines, so yeah. it could happen in the farm and just essentially make it generally look the same, but it takes up about the same amount of space. Yeah, and that is it's funny that I waited about three years, and the moment I wait is when they something like that happens. But I feel like if it was some other printing companies that I've worked with before, that that would not have been the result of a recall and the credit like that. I feel like went above and beyond in my opinion. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like they're doing the right thing and recalling that printer and making sure that it you know, it doesn't pose a safety threat to anybody. So that's, that's always a good thing. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Especially because most of it print and walk away. So. It, well, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you have any uh, cameras on your printers? You know, I can, if you can see which way am I pointing here, <laughs> this guy here, I have a camera on almost every printer uh, that I have and up in the corner here on that guy. Um, so that I can at least when I'm home, which is only about seven minute drive down the road right now, you know, I can look in, see if something's going wrong, you know, because sometimes my prints are like up to 60 hours. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, no, I don't. The the bamboos have them built in, but they're not great, in my opinion, especially where the A1 is located. Because it's a bed slinger, you can't see the print if it's moving. Um, for the Prusas, I, I mean, I could, but it, it would be good if I had, I needed to get the the, the wireless Pi and plug it in and then do the link and then i can do that okay. um, yeah. because they're not wireless i just it wouldn't even matter i could have a camera but i had to do a whole different rig to essentially set up a wireless thing and it's i haven't had an issue we've been in this space for about three years at this point yeah. and i haven't had too much of an issue of course you're going to have the occasional you know blob or something that's going to happen it's any printer i've posted a video and right. <laughs> this happens to be one of my most popular videos um where i have <laughs> blob and they're like ah it's because it's a prusa printer i'm like this could happen to literally any printer so i don't yeah. know why that's the case it was my fault for either not cleaning the bed or something happened right, right. Um, from yeah. um but no I and mean, we haven't really had the need to do that for the most sure. part um so yeah yeah, yeah, just uh, some type of, you know, print monitoring if you're around the prints all the time. If you have shorter prints going on, then it's it might right. not be needed. Um, you know, for some of the longer prints we have going on, it's nice to be able to see, okay, just checking in before I actually go to sleep tonight. Is this okay? Otherwise, I'm running down, you know, trying to fix something before something breaks. But, yeah. 
No, just that, a, I mean, that would be that would be beneficial to to save me from that. I think I think a lot of times people are like, oh, I need to stop stop the print so I can start it again, or I don't want to waste any more film. And generally speaking, depending on where it's at, right? You're not wasting if it's near the top or ninety percent done. I'm like, well, I'm I'll just start it tomorrow. Like it, it's yeah. it'll fail, but I'll I'll fix it tomorrow. Right, right. Yeah, there's some cases where you you know a print is going to fail, and it's like, okay, well let's go see if it's within quality standards. If it's definitely <laughs> not, then it's out the door or whatever. Um, on that side of things, another interesting uh, thing that I've been thinking about recently is with some of these failed prints, right? Are you, have you had any thoughts about trying to recycle uh, printed parts and yeah. what have you tried to come up with? Yeah. So um, for a while we were keeping all of the film in one spot, like, Hey, these all supports or failed or whatever. I was looking, there's a company that's actually based out of Georgia where we're, we're at called Phyllis Struder. And they uh, they have their own machine that you can essentially recycle and then make filament out of it. I needed more space for it. So I wasn't able to do that. I would look into it if it's if it's something you're interested in. Are um, they in Georgia? Yeah, Phyllis Struder? I think so. Okay. There's, I, maybe if there's either that one and there's another one. I was looking at two different companies. They uh, might have a couple different locations. I know... I. I'm pretty sure Phyllostruders out of Vermont, um, but I could be wrong. They might have another location or something, but because um, Phyla, it's Phyla Bot. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. That's the, well, anyways, Phyllostruder, Phyla Bot. I know there's at least one, you know, um, company, I believe out of Vermont uh, that takes those, you know, prints, chews them up, and then you can start to extrude. Well, you can make pellets from that, and then you can have their other machine that ends up making those pellets into, into filament too. Yeah. Um, there, There's a, there was another company and I could have sworn they were in Georgia. Yeah, they're so Phyllis Struder. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or Phyllis Struder, however you want to say it. They're based out of Snellville, Georgia. So they're actually right down the street from us. Okay. Um, but I, it, thought, I thought they had... Phyla, was it Phyla Bot then that was out of... Yeah, uh, that's out of Vermont. Yeah. All right. So those are two different companies then. Gotcha. Would be my guess. There's, uh, there's only so many ways that you can put some type of 3D printing name into a, a company name that you're going after now. Um, well, and that's why I tell people, like, when you're building your brand, I mean, build it around whatever you're doing, but don't necessarily put 3D in it or fill a, we did fill a fi, that was our, yeah. our filament. But I feel like if you want to stick out and not be a 3D printing company, but you want to be whatever the product is, it's like, yeah. build your brand around the product, not around fill, like, 3D yeah. printing. Yeah, some people, you know, they don't care if it's 3D printed or injection molded or whatever. If it's a product that works and it's good and it looks good, then yeah. it could be 3D printed or injection molded and people wouldn't care. Exactly. You know, it might be a little bit of a novelty that it's 3D printed, you know, yeah. the guy, that's kind of what I'm going after with the uh, the Etsy site. So I've got an Etsy site called Texture Dwelling um, that, you know, again, I've tried to like create different brands based on what kind of products we're, we're offering. So not everything is really under the ascent fabrication name per se, it's under the, right. umbrella, let's say, and then we have these, these spinoff brands. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the texture dwelling from, from our Etsy shop, um, haven't really focused on it crazy heavily, but try to create some, you know, consumer products of, um, <clears throat> a, a 3d printed garbage can uh a 3d printed floating shelf um and a couple other different you know consumer objects there that you know maybe it would be again like a novelty thing that right. hey this is 3d printed it's textured on purpose right because of the manufacturing process you know some people it all depends on that marketing aspect of who you go after and how you go after them yeah no absolutely I, it, and this can be with any company i mean if you wanted to like if i was focused focusing specifically on my laser stuff that's you could do that like laser laser beam manufacturing or whatever and like it's yeah that's what we're are, we're known for is that specific piece of it so you could do that i think you just get lost in the sea of like if you type in 3d printed like yeah. you just lost in the sea of 500 other 500,000 people who are are doing something similar to that right that's if it's if i was textured dwelling man i would focus on like home decor and oops exactly uh, all those things specifically but yeah it so happens to be 3d printed right, that's right. My, my personal opinion i think there are people who do it the other way and they make tons of money doing it right because they're yeah. like this is the 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 niche is 3d printing and it just so happens that that's the case and we're, yep. we're really leaning into that so 
Exactly. There's, I don't think there's a wrong way to do it by any means. Yeah. Just from yeah. what I've seen um, from our success, just focusing on the niche of just what happens to be three printed versus the other way around. Right. Right. So would you have any, um, you know, initial mm -hmm. tips and pointers or suggestions for, you know, these, uh, these really enthusiastic hobbyists who are looking to get into some small business uh, aspects? Do you have any kind of, you know, business pointers that you'd want to throw out there for anybody? Yeah. I feel like I'll, I'll probably be a dead horse on this one, but it comes down to de delegation and like working like teamwork with somebody else, right? If you are not strong in one aspect, find someone who is, right? You know, you said you were not, you don't like the marketing and the sales aspect of it. You probably have someone on your team that you're working with that yeah. is good at that part of it, right? And so you can focus on the stuff that you're good at. There's a, there's a really good book called Strength Finders 2.0. I highly suggest this for anybody. And it more or less comes down to is like, instead of trying to be good at everything or okay at everything is focus on what your strengths are, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, you know, focusing on the marketing, the sales, the um, the tech stuff, like I'm, I'm good at that. But if there's someone who came onto my team who's better at technology, give up the reins, let them take that piece of it. Maybe they do the slicing settings better. Maybe they do the, they fix my machines better, whatever it would be, hand it over. And I've, I've had issues with this too, where I've been hard for me to give over social media because at one point I just didn't have the time. So I tried to do that. And I'm like, well, that's not really what I want or how I want it to be done. So I take it back. But I'm actually good at that piece of it. So that's what I like to do. Um, however, I'm not a huge fan of social media per se. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a necessary evil. Um, yeah. This is going to be two pieces of information. This is another one that I would say is think of yourself just with the world that we're living in right now, you're a digital marketer first, and then whatever company you are next, right? So you just so happen to be, I'm a digital marketer who happens to do stuff in 3D printing within whatever the niche that is. And the reason why is because unless you're putting ads out in the paper, everything's going to be on social media. It's going to be via email. It's going to be via um, uh, video, whatever, audio, podcast, whatever that would be. That is what you need to focus on and then have the other aspect of it. But everyone's going to be visually seeing it, hearing your stuff all online. So becoming understanding that piece of it, even if you're not good at it, at least understanding it is going to get you a lot further than someone who's like, yeah, well, I'm an artist who I don't want to do the social media part where well, you, you have to, if you want people to buy your stuff. Right. 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 So. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Honestly, I'm again, I'm not a huge, uh, even personal sharer of things on social media, um, but found it to be a necessary evil for, you know, the business obviously. And, because that's where the consumers are at, you know, they're, they're on social media day in, day out. They're, they're getting hammered with ads They're you know, cause we still are, you know, we're part of that, you know, ecosystem as well, right. uh, obviously. So, you know, content creation is, is a, is an art form in itself to, you know, best highlight what the product is, what your company does and how you best, you know, serve your customers and yeah. what type of customers are you trying to attract, right? Um, so I've learned quite a bit over the last couple of years about, you know, content creation and how to approach different kinds of customers, either business to business, business, to, business to consumer, right. Oh, Very yeah. two different beasts there. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, I've, I've followed a couple of podcasts that have kind of helped me as a business owner. Um, I don't know if you listen to any other podcasts out there, but, um, specifically, and you know, you, you take the good with the the not so good, maybe from some of these people that are works for you, out right? there, yeah. right? Um, but uh, real business owners uh, podcast. That's a that's one podcast that I've definitely uh, been attracted to, just from a standpoint of like the day in day out grind of look. You know, you might not be doing well uh, one week, but you know, you got to hit the ground running the next week, and here's a list of task items that you got to go do. Um, they are some like no nonsense guys that, uh, would really, you know, light a fire under your butt if you needed it. Um, so real business owners yeah. are pretty, pretty interesting to follow. Um, and then again, this other guy that I, that I'm more recently following, he's on a, a much higher level and in intensity. <laughs> um, Alex Hormozy. I, you know <laughs> I, I, I knew you were going to list him. Everyone, <laughs> everyone listen. He's, he's good. He's good at what he does and he's, He's very intelligent, but yes, he's very much like I don't I don't give a crap about what you your feelings or anything like that. We're gonna right. get right down to it. 
Right. Yeah. And it, and that's the thing. It's like when you take some little bits of information from these guys, you know, they are successful in their own right for different reasons. Yeah. Uh, so if I can learn even little one nugget of information from, from that kind of person, uh, yeah. I think that's still very beneficial for me to figure out how to apply that within my business and, and help other people do that as well. So agree. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Those two. So Alex from Mosey's podcast, the game, and then um, I just got gifted a, a book um, from one of my friends uh, from Alex Hermosi. It was uh, $100 million leads. Yeah, uh, it's a good book. Yep, it was pretty good. Just finished it last night, actually. Um, yeah. So, you know, haven't, haven't actually done a lot of reading in the past since uh, college. So I'm starting to get back into that side of things. Yeah. Um, I listened know. to all my books, but he read that book. So it, um, yeah. Yeah, it was good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, listening, you know, whether you're a listener, whether you're a reader, whether you take in videos, you know, that's why we do the the video podcast here uh, for Fabrication Friday and then um, post it on the uh, the audio as well, because people take in information all different kinds of ways. Exactly. Uh, and might need to might need to hear the same information different ways. Right. Um, you know, for the same reason, Alex Ramosi had his book, you know, written and then actually had an audio book of it, um, having different types of consuming, I think helps. Um, and for our standpoints as business owners, being able to offer content creation that speaks to the readers, the watchers, the listeners as well. Um, okay. you know, again, depending on your, your niche industry, uh, your products, you got to find, you know, what's going to work for you. Um, so I'd agree with everything that you kind of went off there for the, the business side of things. I appreciate your insights on that. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Uh, well, this has been good stuff. I appreciate the time, Alex. Thanks for sharing your, uh, your journey here with Parton Prince. Um, you know, I look forward to working more with you here and, uh, hopefully our, our listeners here gain some insights on, uh, maybe how to bring their hobby into a, a business plan. So thanks. Yeah, for absolutely. Um, follow us on Instagram, Parton Prince right here. Uh, it looks like Patron sometimes, but it's definitely Parton. Uh, I've gotten that mixed up. So just make sure you're typing it in right in all the socials. <laughs> Great, great. Well, thanks for the time, Alex, again. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, seeing what else Parton Prince uh, goes after. So good stuff. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. So that was great to hear from Alex from Parton Prince. Um, it's always great to see when another fellow you know, 3D printing enthusiast has really gone after it pretty hard um, and, and started his own business and uh, working on it with his, uh, with his wife as well. So you know, having that kind of uh, approach of, I can do this, I'm not going to stop until I make it um, is really what, you know, the having this entrepreneurial mindset is all about. You know, I can remember uh, when I first started Ascent Fab, um, you know, I was looking for kind of what are we really wanting to get into? You know, I mentioned earlier on in the in the podcast, you know, really want to find your niche in uh, in utilizing 3D printing for um, creating something new, innovative or some otherwise, you know, couldn't be uh, traditionally fabricated uh, or offering a pretty unique experience uh, with your 3D printing that you're offering. So, you know, with that, finding your niche and getting started, um, it is a little bit about kind of throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks, uh, but you really want to focus in on what you're passionate about and what you see some of your customers are really liking from uh, the offerings that you have. And just staying up to date on kind of what people are really looking to have 3D printed. Um, sometimes it's not about just the novelty that it is 3D printed, although that could bring in some people. Um, but it could just be about, you know, we're, we're looking at maybe consumer products that uh, these are going to be in people's homes day in, day out uh, from, from here on out. So looking at things that could maybe go into Target or some other uh, small box stores, local stores, maybe that um, people are just picking up off the shelves simply because they know that they want that in their home. Um, not so much that it's 3D printed, they might not care, they might not even know, um, but really just focus on, you know, what are you passionate about? What's your niche? And uh, and reach out to us for, uh, you know, us at Ascent Fab or Alex there at Parton Prints for some advice on how to get started or uh, how to grow your, uh, you know, side hustle into uh, a full-blown business. So. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening to the Fabrication Friday podcast. Um, happy printing, and we'll see you next time.